We've been in the series of back in context, looking at how are we studying the Bible. There's some of these favorite verses that we're reading or we'll say quickly, off the cuff of our hands, without even really thinking about maybe the context. And before we know it, what we're saying is completely not even close to what the writer was really trying to say in the beginning. Now, uh, I did have that paper back there. Some of you, if you didn't have it last week, it has a map. We'll continue to go through it. But there's this passage that we talk often, especially when it comes to, well, here, I'll, I'll read it, and you guys tell me when we use it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He will come on into the house. How do we typically use that verse? When have you heard that verse maybe said? Maybe not. Invitation hymns. Invitation hymns. You know, yeah. Evangelism. Well, that's typically what I've always heard was uh, hope for those who don't know Jesus. Hey, hey, I, Jesus is there at the door knocking. Right? And if, if you would just accept him, he'll come on in. And we get this picture of these non-Christians that Jesus is going to doors knocking on. But what does the context say? Whose door is he really knocking on? Oh, well, let's go through the interpretive journey. So we're going to be looking at that interpretive journey. We're grasping the text in their own town, seeing what it was like for them. Then we're looking at that river, how distant it is for, from us to them, looking at the bridge. What's the thing, the theological principle that we take from their time that is from God's word? What is the principle that's being shared that's applied to our life? So looking at that, of course, whenever we're looking at any of these texts, it'd be great to know who's writing. And at the beginning of Revelation, it tells us that John's writing. I won't go into all that fun stuff. Some speculate three different Johns between the different angels. But we know that John is writing, and he has been uh, received this revelation from Jesus Christ. Who's he writing to? Jesus is saying, hey, I'm writing to the churches in Asia Minor. There's seven of these churches here. And there's a word that they're needing to hear. They've been going on for a couple of years as a church, and well, I'm starting to see where they're headed. And I'd love to give some words of either caution, warning, or advice, or encouragement. Some of them, all of those. But who did it to specifically in this passage? Well, it's to the church of Laodicea. Do you know anything about Laodicea? Fair enough. <laughs> That's what's so great about things like this, that handbook back there. I'll give you a little bit of context in a moment. But he, it opens up and saying, Jesus saying, hey, okay, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this, and he'll give this letter. It says, the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation, Laodicea, here is your letter. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Man, would that be either be cold or hot? No, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Like you say, well, I'm rich. I'm prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you, please. To buy from me the gold that's been refined by fire. So that you may be rich. And go buy the white garments. Jesus is continuing to allude to himself here. That white garments so that you may clothe yourself. And the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent, please. I'm telling you guys these words because I love you. Because I'm standing at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, oh man, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Just as I conquered and I sat down with my father on his throne. Please, anybody who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <coughs> what kind of 
context do we have now? What, who is this verse speaking to? The church. Oh. Wake up call. That verse is talking to us. Well, at least I don't see it. We'll have to make contact on context right now. That's where we're at right now. But this is talking to lukewarm Christians, church in Laodicea. Whoa, that's a little different than what we typically read that verse as, isn't it? So what was going on there? Like, why is Jesus having to say these things? Let's go. <coughs> Hot springs, aqueducts, and lukewarm water. Okay, that that's, sums it up pretty quick, but let's go through that. Even here, simply, I'll just read it. The lukewarm church, otherwise known, Laodicea was a banking center. Proud of its wealth. Beautified with resplendent temples and theaters. Noted for its manufacture of rich garments. So Jesus talking about the garments here. Uh -huh. Rich garments of black glossy wool. And a medical school that made powder for treatment of the eye. The slave of the south for the eye. This may have, this may have suggested the riches, the garments, in the south. So now we know a little bit more about Laodicea, right? That was quick. So we're caught up a little bit more. But I don't know about you, but Laodicea also had access to these hot springs. Okay? And they had these aqueducts. And the aqueducts would bring in the hot springs, nice hot water to the city, but sometimes the aqueducts didn't work quite well. Well, by the time the water got to the city, it may have not been so hot anymore. When you turn the hot water on, it may have been warm. I don't know if you guys have this issue, but at our house, for uh, some reason, our kitchen sink, especially when we're trying to do dishes, has a label. I don't know if yours has a label, but ours says hot. It's supposed to be hot water. So we're doing dishes and we turn on the hot water. Mm. Lukewarm. That doesn't work too well when I'm trying to do dishes. It's actually pretty frustrating when I'm trying to do dishes and I need hot water and the water is lukewarm. Right? Mm. Now, unless our dishwasher is running or the laundry is running, don't put your hand in that because it will burn you. I've had experience. So this, uh, anyways, that's just our house. It's a little frustrating. But the point is, when we're needing hot water, when we're expecting hot water, it would be nice to have some hot water to be able to do dishes, do whatever we need to do, and not have any warm water. On the alternative, maybe a cold, nice cold glass of water, been a hot day, turn on the cold water, and if it never gets cold, that ain't nice either. <laughs> I needed a cold glass of water anyways. But that, that's maybe a picture here. Like me trying to wash my dishes that was labeled hot water that came out lukewarm might be like trying to claim to be a follower of Christ. Saying, I trust and I follow Christ. Yet really what comes out is no trust or belongings in Christ. Our label claims to be hot water yet we're just lukewarm. See, Jesus was saying, hey, at least with the cold, Okay, at least with cold water, people who are cold to Christ, they claim it, they don't live by Christ. Okay, there's a spot for ministry there. With hot water, claim to follow Christ. I follow him, I love him, I trust him. The alpha, they are. What about if we're claiming, I trust Christ, I follow Christ, I trust him. And yet we're not trusting him. That may be lukewarm. See, we have the title, hot water. Christian, follower of Christ. I trust him. But really, I, I'm not. I'm not trusting him. Is that what's maybe going on here? So these, he even goes as far as saying, either a cold or a hot is better than this lukewarmness of claiming to be a Christian and not living. 
Let's trust. Let's, well, sorry. I meant to say trading the trust. My bad here. So switch that around. Trading the trust. You can put that in your notes. Switch it around. Trading the trust. See, Laodicea was that major trade route, right? And with this trade route, it could be very successful. Uh, point, uh, remember when we separate the difference between Laodicea and us? I think that might be one of them. We're no longer a major trade route, right? Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> we're not a major trade route anymore. Maybe when we had the railroad coming through a couple of decades ago, a couple of decades, right? Uh, but we are no longer a major trade route, so we don't necessarily see the flourishing city that this has become. That maybe you, Jamie, did see at one point, right? Yeah. The buildings that were built up, the hotels, the, all these different things. Like, people were making a life, a pretty good life here. They ought to see was that. These people could quickly trust in their hard work, their financial wealth, the glorious name they made for themselves, and so on. Jesus was like, hello? I'm here. You forget about me. I see that you have a title Christian on your house, but it looks like you're trusting in those other things more. I'm here. You gonna let me in? Revelation 3.17, for you say, I'm rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. And Jesus is like, hello? You don't realize that you are rich, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You're trusting in the things that you have, this well, the rich, the wealth, the prosper, all these things, and I'm all good. You know, you have the title, but you trust in me. See, many Christians in Laodicea had this the label Christian. Yet their trust was no longer in Christ, but in their things they built up. Now let's measure the width of that river. Step two. This would be quick, right? What's one of the things that I already mentioned? What's the difference between us? Well, Laodicea and us. We were a trade route. Yeah, they were a trade route. We've got some trade here. I get that. We've got some trade here. And they're doing well. I'm just, we're not a major trade route like Laodicea. That's a big difference, okay? They were a major city at that time. Uh, we're not the church in Laodicea. Like, we're a UG Christian church, right? But there's a difference, okay? So remembering the context and where we are. Uh, we don't have aqueducts built from town to town bringing us hot water. We just have our well wells and everything else. Uh, anything else? The point of this step is just to remember in context what the text was saying to who. The next step is to then take the principle for us today. To let God's word lead into our lives today. What is that principle? I was stuck. I actually had this one written up. Um, and then on the way down here this morning, I actually realized, ah, there's a second part to this. And, and the two parts is uh, that at first I was like, it's better. As Jesus was saying, it's better to either follow through. Okay, follow through in what you claim. Follow through as either being hot or cold. Like, at least if you're cold to Christ, you're following it. And there's a room for ministry there. If you're hot, and if you're like hot water, and you claim to follow Christ, follow through with it. Follow Christ, but please. He said it, it's detestable. It's like that lukewarm water that I'm about to spit out. If you keep claiming, I'm trusting you, God, and yet, So I was like, okay, well, that, that might be the principle. Then as I kept thinking about Laodicea and us, and Laodicea and us, I was like, maybe it's the second point. If we, and which still ties into the first, but if we claim to follow Christ, then trade our trust in the possessions that we have for the trust that we have in Christ. Right? 
He's like, I don't need anything. And he's like, guys, do you not realize salvation is through me alone? You guys are in more need than you realize. Trade this gold down here for the gold that's been purified by me in heaven. Himself. Trade your garments, your dirty clothes, your white rags for the white washed rags. For the right white washed clothes, garments that I've given through the cross. Trade our trust in the possessions for our trust in Christ. Now let's consult the map. Does this theological principle fit the rest of the Bible? Honestly, at first, I had hesitation. Because in reality, we just talked about when Paul was in prison, right? For Philippians 4.13, when we put that back into context, he was in prison and he said, hey, there's some people here that are teaching Christ. The motives of their heart are... But at least Christ is being proclaimed. Huh. Well then, I don't know. They've been lukewarm. And he's like, hey, so be it. Well then I remembered, hey, the gospel was being preached. The gospel remains the same always. And then, that is great. But then Jesus takes it the next step with those who felt like they were fine since they had the title of Christian they didn't really follow Christ with their trust he takes it to the next step I mean, we've been seeing it with the Pharisees who trusted God and yet when God gave the Messiah they didn't trust him he says have you read it if you did if you actually trusted and believed then you would believe that I am he who God sent saying beforehand okay you guys have these titles, and yet the trust wasn't there. It's like whitewashed tombs, you guys, and the clean cups on the outside, and all that stuff. And it's like, okay. What about Colossians? A year ago, for Easter. Actually, it was a year ago, I know what. A year ago at Easter, we went through Easter and Colossians. And the main point that we were hoping to get from Colossians was that Christ is sufficient and superior to all other things. Right? Okay, so trusting in Christ, that's what he was talking about the whole time. Not trusting in all these Christ and things. Like, no, Christ. Christ is sufficient. That's our trust. Christ. Because nothing else is going to take us to the Father besides Christ. Okay, Galatians 4 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you now turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world who slaves you want to be once more? I'm following Christ. And then now they're backsliding, going back to trusting and doing these other things. What about Judas? It was already mentioned this morning. Followed Christ for those years, and yet in the end no longer trusted Jesus as the Messiah. At least the Messiah he probably pictured, along with the Jews. James, too. What good is it, brothers, if someone says he has faith, but the life doesn't show it? Can that faith alone save him? If a brother or sister is poor, clothed, poorly clothed, and they, you know, they're sitting there and they need food, and you're like, hey, go in peace, be warm, and be filled with food. And you're going to give them food or like, clothing. Well, come on. What good is the faith title if our lives are following? No, they go hand in hand. Faith and works, works and faith both together. And then honestly, even with this lukewarmness, he's like, look, some of you guys believe that God is one. Yet be. Even the demons do that. They know that God is one. So just having the title is that. Jesus said, abide in me. Without me, you cannot bear, or you cannot produce my fruit. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Ooh. Okay. Jesus, he was saying, hey, people will say, Jesus, I've done all these things for you in your name. But Jesus would say, I never knew you. We didn't have a relationship to trust the abiding in. What about Israel? The title. 
God's people. Yet at times, they were cold toward God, worshiping other gods. The title was there, but they left God outside the door. Let's grasp the text in our own town. In your own lives. How do you live this out? Well, let's review real quick. Whose door is Jesus not the one? Wandering, if the people inside will open up the door. Whose door was Jesus really knocking on? Ours. Christians. In context, it was to the lukewarm Christians. Jesus standing outside of their doors knocking. Hey, will they open up to Jesus? Now, by be that wake up call for us, who or what are we trusting in? I realize sometimes I'm, I'm trying to trust my own strength, my work, my own hope. Please give me enough hope for today. Maybe I'm trying to make up something. That maybe I'm trying to trust in just the love of my family or from my family or education, a title, investments, possessions. Hey, my laptop was not working at the church, and I had to get these slides up. Like, I realize I'm maybe trusting it a little too much. But just I realize who or what are we trusting in? And secondly, have we become lukewarm toward Christ in our life? We have the title, but our trust says differently. Maybe we've call, grown up calling ourselves Christian, growing up in a family that said, we are Christians. But you realize that it hasn't meant much throughout the years. Jesus and us are kind of acquaintances. We know of them. I heard Jesus at the door. That's about all the closer we've got to him. Maybe you realize you haven't really trusted Jesus. Or that there is maybe something else <coughs> behind following Jesus than just an ethnic title, if you would. Christian. So let's finish up. Jesus is knocking on the doors of lukewarm Christians, too. He's already available. He's at the door, at the home, at your job, at your events. Will we let him in? Will we grow in this relationship we have with Jesus? Let's conclude. At least the convictions I have from this passage. Please do not claim to follow Christ and yet not trust Him. Please, I'm saying this to myself too. Please do not claim to follow Christ and yet not trust Him. Let Him into our life. He's knocking at the door. He's paid the price for our whole being to be restored with this eternal relationship with God. Please let Jesus in. Jesus is knocking on the Christian homes who have become lukewarm in their trust toward Christ. Now the exciting part. There's a part in here that I quickly look briefed over. I know some of you have let him in. Most of you have let him in a long time ago. Maybe it's been a while ago. Maybe it's starting to grow lukewarm and you're like, I need to start letting you in a little bit more again, right? But maybe you have already let Christ in a long time ago. Or recently, remembering, being renewed by what Christ has done in your life and is doing. And you and Him are feasting together. You guys are there in the room together, sharing life together. Look at that verse. Behold. Well, He said, Behold, I say at the door and knock. But He says, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. With him and eat with him and he with me. The two are present with each other, growing in your relationship, trusting and receiving the hope that Christ has already given to us by his grace. And that is an invite to all people, even those who have grown lukewarm toward Christ over the years. Behold, I stand at the door 
and now. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will eat. And he will eat with me. The one who conquers, the ones who traded in their, well, their trust for their possessions and trust for what Christ has done, those who conquer, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, just as I had conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Please, anybody who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word that you, that you revealed to Laodicea, that you spoke to through your son, Jesus Christ, that John wrote down so we could have for life, that we get to read from, that we get to learn from, and that can maybe help guide us and will guide us in our life. If we let you in. Thank you, God, that you have already been at that door. You've already offered. You've already offered that opportunity through your grace, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Maybe, say, all of us, we've grown lukewarm. And at this point, you've got to push Jesus out the door. And he's knocking. May we hear him. May we hear your word. May we hear your spirit speak through you your word through Christ into our life. May we let you in. May this be a time to be renewed, to remember what it means to follow you, God, to follow Christ, to follow him each day, to be a student of his, to be a child of yours. God, we thank you for everything that you have already done and will do. May we have the ears to listen. To then live it out. As we invite Christ into our life each day. We say this through his name. Amen.